the other lectures, um, as I'm going to first talk a little bit about my own work, which is um, quite a nice opportunity for me to present to you what I'm doing. This also means it will be a quite short presentation. And uh, afterwards, I will show you um, how to get some Landsat images and um, how you can use my software to do some um, processing atmosphere correction and maybe export some um, parameters based on remote sensing reflectance or marine reflectance. So um, first of all, Landsat is uh, pretty amazing. So we've, we've started using Landsat 8 since its um, operational phase starting in May 2013. And from the moment we were looking at these images, we thought um, this, that this quality of these images is really great. And at 30 meter resolution, you can see so many things happening um, that just get lost at, at uh, one kilometer scale from Modis, for example. So you see here the coast of northwestern Australia, and you have there a scale bar of 10 kilometers. So these are 10 Modis pixels, and this is what you get at 30 meter resolution with Landsat. You just see so many things. These are um, all swirls of sediment going around these islands, and you see these uh, turbulent wakes um, behind these these islands. But uh, more, more specifically in Europe, we're also interested in, um, in these high resolution sensors because we have um, EU regulations that require us to monitor inland and coastal waters, up including the first nautical mile. So with moderate resolution sensors of one kilometer resolution, you can't really do the first um, nautical mile from the coast because you have mixed pixels and, and things like that. And many inland water bodies are too small to resolve with to appropriate to really resolve with one kilometer data. So um, Landsat 8 was launched in 2013. We've been using it for two years now, and it's been, it's been a great ride. And Sentinel-2, which is a similar sen satellite to Landsat 8, was just launched a couple of weeks ago. And both of those have the advantage to go down to 10 meter, uh, tens of meters resolution, and the data is free. There's a little bit of a trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal resolution. So with MODIS, you get approximately daily revisits. With these types of sensors, you get, um, um, oh. yeah, I'm running this in a virtual box, which I can't put on full screen because I have a widescreen laptop and this is a square, but so it will switch off once in a while. So um, the trade-off between spatial resolution and temporal resolution is with Landsat 8, you get a 16-day revisit time, which for some processes is not really good. And Sentinel-2 has a revisit time of 10 days, but there will be a second Sentinel-2 launched, um, I think, early next year. So with two Sentinel-2s and a Landsat 8, we could get pretty decent revisit times. Uh, and so those sensors have a spatial resolution. Landsat 8 is at 30 meter resolution. Sentinel-2 has bands going from 10 to 60 meter resolution. So we can observe new things we couldn't be observe with, um, with MODIS before. We are looking at small-scale sediment transport, human impacts, and we're monitoring also um, shipping and offshore construction and dredging activities because we, we have these um, high-resolution data now. And we have a processing challenge, but also maybe an opportunity for processing of moderate-resolution data is that now we might be able to resolve spatially glints, waves, and foam well, the moderate resolution processing chains, um, they assume a certain statistical distribution over a moderate resolution pixel, while with these things we might be able to resolve this and perhaps improve the moderate resolution processing. So the, re the research I'm doing is developing these atmospheric correction schemes for um, Landsat 8 and for Sentinel-2, specifically for coastal environments which are often turbid and also for inland waters which have varying, very variable um, in-water um, constituents. So basically we'll, I'll be focusing on a turbid water atmospheric correction which is in many cases similar to a clear water atmospheric correction but we need uh, um, some, some different assumptions. And I've developed a, a processor called Acolyte, which does Landsat 8 processing, which I will show you later. And I've worked together with the CDES developers to get um, the OLI, so OLI is the imager on Landsat 8, the OLI processing into CDES, and it's now um, available as a version 7.2. So basically, Landsat 8 um, has two imaging instruments. One of them uh, is the OLI, it's the operational land imager. It's got um, eight relatively narrow 30 meter bands. So we see here a list of bands. We have nine bands here. The pan band is a 
spectrally quite wide band at 15 meter resolution, so you could potentially use this pan band to, to sharpen the, the other bands. The second instrument on Landsat 8 is the thermal infrared image, imager or something, and the TIRS, which has two bands in the, in the mid-infrared, which, which can be used to derive uh, surface temperatures, for example. So the swath of the satellite is what it sees in a single overpass is about 185 kilometers, which means you have about 7,000 pixels um, to, one, to one image. And as I mentioned before, we have a 16-day overpass uh, track repeat. And if you go to higher latitudes, these tracks will join together. So there's potential for, for, more, um, for more acquisitions. So here I've plotted uh, um, the relative spectral responses for the um, nine bands on the OLI. So you see here there's four visible bands, um, two blue bands, a green band, and a red band. As you can see from this scale, all these bands are pretty wide, so they're not the typical ocean color um, 10 nanometer or 20 nanometer wide bands. Because if you go down to this resolution, you need a certain um, spectral bandwidth to get enough photons on your detector to have a good signal to noise. Um, you also see here in the black, that's a panchromatic channel. So this is an even wider channel, which allows you to go down to 15 meter resolution. And then we have a couple of bands in the infrared. We have the near infrared band here and two shortwave infrared bands, which um, I like very much. And then there's a, a cirrus band um, fixed, um, centered on an atmospheric absorption feature, which can be used to detect very high clouds, which um, are pretty difficult to detect with, with the other bands. So the way... Uh, The OLI is constructed, so I, I mentioned before you have about 7,000 detectors um, in the swath of OLI, and they're um, fixed in 14 focal plane modules, so each one of those has um, about 1 14th of 7,000 detectors, and you have the different bands arranged like this. So this is a, a push scanning, scan broom instrument, so these 7,000 detectors will move um, across the, the land surface like this. And each one of those detector detectors is actually a radiometer for one of these spectral channels. So if I go back, um, each one of those um, detectors has its actually its own spectral response function, but we, we're using an average one here. So each one of those um, strips here is a different channel and has a certain amount of these pixels. And again, the panchromatic band has four times as many pixels as the, as the 30 meter uh, well, twice as many pixels lengthwise, but there's also two pixels in the in the other direction. So what um, each of these detectors measure is a digital count, similar to um, the instruments we've been using, and then USGS provide us, provides us with two different um, scaling factors, or we can go to top of atmosphere radiance. So these are radiances um, converted from the digital count in the instrument or we can use top of atmosphere reflectance, um, which is a dimensionless, dimensionless factor, basically um, scaling the top of atmosphere radiance to the extraterrestrial solar irradiance at this point um, for a given solar angle. And um, there's a seasonality factor uh, taking into account the distance um, between the sun and, and the earth. So a Landsat image typically looks like this. So this is, I've taken a pretty recent image for this because I had to process the data here anyway for the, the lecture. So I've taken um, 30th of June this year image for the Southern North Sea and the English Channel. So we have here um, the Thames estuary. We have here a part of the Belgian, uh, Belgian coastal zone. And so this is about 185 kilometers uh, wide. And as you can see, this, uh, this image has a slightly blue hue to it. And if we, look at, um, if we look at a pixel there, so this pixel comes from one set of the, the eight detectors um, combining in, combines into this spectrum. So we can see this blue hue very clearly in the first two bands. So we, have, um, we should have seven bands here, um, three in the infrared and then the four visible ones. You see this spectrum is quite peaked in the blue. 
And if we look at, so this is a relatively clear pixel here. If we look at another pixel that's a little bit more turbid, we see there's um, slightly higher reflectances here in the blue, but the general shape is, is actually the same. And this shape is actually because we are um, mainly observing the Rayleigh reflectance from the atmosphere. So if we go back to this, um, this thing, we have the top of atmosphere reflectance, which is the radiance measured by the satellite uh, normalized to the incoming uh, radiance from the, from the sun. We can assume that this uh, reflectance is the sum of aerosol reflectance, Rayleigh reflectance. We can include foam and glint terms, and then finally also a water term, which is actually the spectrum we want to derive from these, uh, these satellite images. What we've done is simplify this atmospheric correction by ignoring foam and glint um, at this stage. So just um, assuming that the top of atmosphere reflectance is aerosols, Rayleigh scattering, and the signal from the, from the water. So if we simplify this, um, we come to this equation. And um, we, have, we have this term is the water leaving radiance reflectance or marine reflectance just above the sea surface, which is um, which the, where the diffuse at, um, transmittance of the atmosphere has to be taken into account as well to, to transfer it to the top of atmosphere. And then we have a Rayleigh reflectance term, which is pretty easy to determine because it is directly related to the thickness of the atmosphere. So it's scattering by air molecules. And um, I think it's been mentioned before, there's a strong dependency uh, with wavelength. So this determines this um, strong shape into, into the blue. So basically, we have lookup tables where we can use the geometry at the time of the satellite image. Maybe we can also take into account atmospheric pressure, because if your atmospheric pressure changes, your uh, path length through the atmosphere, the number of air molecules um, encountered by the light will, will also increase. The big problem we have is this aerosol reflectance term, because the aerosols, you, you can't calculate in advance what the aerosols are, because those are the particles in the atmosphere, and they change um, quite a lot in space-time and composition. But we can easily compute the Rayleigh reflectance, and if we subtract this from the top of atmosphere reflectance, we get this factor here, which is the Rayleigh corrected reflectance, so top of atmosphere reflectance times the Rayleigh, which we can easily compute. And we're left with a sum of aerosol reflectance and um, the water reflectance we're, we're interested in. So these are the two spectra. I showed you earlier, so the clear-ish pixel and the turbid water pixel, and this is what the Rayleigh, um, the Rayleigh reflectance looks like for, for those two pixels. So basically, most of that shape is coming from the Rayleigh reflectance. So you have this strong wavelength dependency, and if we subtract these, um, you see this image is, has slightly um, more natural colors. This is because I've subtracted the Rayleigh reflectance from the from the red, green, and blue uh, channels. If we look at those pixels here now, we see the top of atmosphere. We have a very, we have a very blue spectrum. Then if we subtract the Rayleigh, we see something like this, which is uh, still pretty blue because we are in clear-ish waters. If we look at the turbid uh, pixel, the top of atmosphere is also quite blue. If we subtract the Rayleigh, we see that the peak is more moving towards the um, towards the green end of the spectrum, and we have a pretty significant contribution in the red and near infrared as well. Um, one of the things um, we typically assume in the aerosol correction of, of, um, of satellite images is that we don't expect a signal in the, in the infrared part of the spectrum. Typical ocean waters, we, we are using bands here at 750 and 850 nanometers approximately, where the water absorption is so high that in oceanic waters you can assume that there's no light coming from the, from the ocean. In turbid waters, you, you can't really do this because, um, because if there's a lot of sediment in the water, you will get a signal in the near infrared. And even you can get signals even at um, 12, 40 nanometers, for example, in one of the MODIS um, shortwave infrared bands. However, we are very lucky with Landsat to have these channels here at 1600 and 2200 nanometers, where the um, pure water absorption is really, really high, and we can assume that all water surfaces are black in, the, in these uh, 
in these bands. So, if, for example, here we have a remaining um, a remaining signal in the Rayleigh corrected reflectance, which we can assume is directly coming from things that are left in the atmosphere or surface effects as well. So, if you have glint or um, roughness differences in the surface or a slick on the surface, for example, you, you can also get uh, get some reflectance here, but we assume this is coming from, from the aerosols. So um, we've looked at two different uh, methods for the aerosol correction. So if we, if we look at the Rayleigh corrected reflectance, so top of atmosphere minus this Rayleigh reflectance, which we can easily compute, we are left with aerosol reflectance and water reflectance. We can find the aerosol reflectance for bands where the, air, where the water reflectance is zero. So in open ocean waters, anything in the near infrared will be zero water reflectance. In turbid waters, we will need to move to, to longer wavelengths. So the first atmospheric correction scheme we used was using a red and a near infrared band on Landsat. So those terms, Rayleigh really corrected reflectance, are basically aerosol, uh, aerosol reflectance plus the water reflectance in those two bands. If we move to clear waters, we can um, assume that the Rayleigh really corrected reflectances are equal to the aerosol reflectances in those two bands. And if we take the ratio of these, well, we, we know that um, in the clear waters, this, uh, these two are, well, they are equal to the aerosol reflectance. If we take the ratio of this, we, we have some sort of idea of the spectral um, shape of the aerosol, uh, spectral shape of the aerosol. And in this method, we assume that in one Landsat scene or in one sub-region we're looking at, the aerosol will be the same over the clear water type, uh, over the clear water pixels and the turbid water pixels. And then we have a second assumption here that the ratio of the water reflectances in those two bands is more or less a constant. This works pretty well for um, the MODIS near infrared bands, for example, um, that are about there. But if we move to Landsat bands, we're looking at 655 and 865. So this ratio is, is pretty big, but you see there's also a little bit of uh, variability. So this is the marine reflectance normalized to marine reflectance at 780 here. So, so if you're looking at the ratio, when you say it's 8.7, is that, at, that's not at 650, is it? So it's like most of the values are less than 8. Yeah, that's, that's at 655, but this is, this is normalized to 780, so the ratio here is, um, <laughs> is between 655 and 856, so that's where, where the difference comes from. And then um, if we have... There will be another talk about atmospheric correction. <laughs> yeah. If you don't understand now, it's okay. You're going to have other Um, and basically, if we have those two assumptions, uh, well, we, we find this in the scene. We go to clear waters, find this spectral dependency of the aerosol. We have this marine model, which works pretty well for lower turbidities. We can um, derive marine reflectance in the, in the red channel, for example. And if we use um, the spectral dependency to select an aerosol model, we can move also to, to other channels. So this is how this um, really corrected reflectances. So this is really corrected reflectance in a near infrared channel, and this is in a red channel. That's how it looks like um, if you plot them on a on a scatter plot. What we see here is the things here. Those are clear waters plus an aerosol. So we see um, if we look at these waters, we we have a pretty pretty well defined relationship, which is basically this epsilon, the ratio between the really corrected reflectances. And then we have here this cloud of points that are, that's the turbid waters plus an aerosol contribution also. So we see here the black line is, that's approximately this 8.7 we're using as a marine model. You see there's a little bit of variability and it's not really linear. If you look here, you see some, some saturation happening. The second aerosol correction we've um, tried is using the near infrared and sphere bands or both sphere bands and I like this one very much uh, because in both of those bands we can assume the water reflectance is zero so 
after Rayleigh correction, all we're left with is the aerosol um, reflectance. Then if we take the ratio of these two, we find the spectral dependency of the aerosol. And this is very nice because in all pixels we can assume both bands to be zero, so we can determine this aerosol type per pixel, or we can fix one over the entire scene. Then this, using the near-infrared and short infrared bands, is pretty similar. We have one band where the, the water leaving um, radiance reflectance is zero, and then one where we have some signal from, from the water. There we move again to clear waters to find this um, spectral dependency and assume it's fixed over your sub-scene or your scene. And then um, here it's really easy to compute. We have the really corrected reflectance in our reference long wavelength band. We have this epsilon, so we can go co correct this um, really corrected band in the near infrared or in any other band um, for the aerosol reflectance. And this is very nice because we don't assume anything on the, um, the, the marine reflectance ratios other than in the other method we had this strict linear relationship while here we we don't um, take that into account. So these are the really corrected reflectances in the sphere bands. We see there's a lot of clouds happening, uh, clouds, um, a lot of spread happening there, but basically um, we're applying a non-water mask and assume everything there is clouds or land or ships or whatever, and if we cut this off using this non-water mask, we are left with this relationship, which is if you take the ratio of this, comes back to your spectral dependency of the aerosols. Because we can assume in both those bands there is no signal from the water. So if you do a linear um, regression or take the median from this, from this cloud, we can get the, the aerosol type. And then we, we have this aerosol type, which is the spectral relationship between the aerosol reflectance in two bands, but we need to get to the other bands as well. And uh, therefore we need an aerosol extrapolation. What CDAS does is it uses those two values to find two best fitting aerosol models out of 80. So they have 80 aerosol models, then they weigh, the, um, weigh those models and find what they think the aerosol will look like. What we do in Acolyte is just use an exponential extrapolation. Um, just take those two values, well, take one value at the long wavelength, take this um, ratio, and then do the exponential extrapolation, which is a very simple method. It's not always um, very good, but then again, in CDAS, they try to, um, to characterize this aerosol spectral variability with just two points out of 80 um, model so there could be could be some noise um, added there again. So if we com come back to our um, two pixels we're looking at, um, we have top of atmosphere after Rayleigh correction and then you see here this little bit is the aerosol reflectance in the longest wavelength band. We have at 1.6 we have a second estimate of this aerosol reflectance we take those two points and we fit an exponential through it and then subtract this from the Rayleigh corrected reflectance to get in the red curve here the water reflectance. And we see very nicely that this puts down the, um, the reflectance, the water reflectance in the short wave infrared to zero. So it's, it's quite similar to the um, red or near infrared corrections we've been doing for the, the absorption measurements, for example. We just know this is, this is not coming from the water. We have an estimate of how much it is and then we have to fit a model through to um, subtract this from, from the really corrected reflectances. And now you start also to see that in the turbid water pixel here we have much higher reflectances especially in the in the green and red. We have some non-zero signal here in the near infrared. This is why typical ocean color um, um, correction methods will fail in these pixels because they assume this is also zero. But then again in the in the short wave infrared, those things should be should be zero. So now we have for this image in all the bands uh, the the water leaving uh, reflectances, and we can start playing around with it. So this is, for example, the water reflectance in the red band. So we see clear relationship where the um, the RGB shows you 
there are a lot of sediments, while we retrieve a higher um, red reflectance. In the middle of this image, we are getting some negative values in the marine reflectance, so this means that we have subtracted a little bit too much with our um, aerosol correction. And then here, we have pixels mixed, uh, masked because of um, surface effects. I think it's to do um, with glint. As this is a summer image, um, many of the eastern, the east side of the, the images are often, there's often a little bit of, of glint. And these are masked by this 2.1% threshold on the 1.6 micron band. If, can, do you adjust that um, exponential extrapolation once you know that you have some some negative values in the clear water, can you use that to help you predict a better exponential such that those go to zero and not negative within your uncertainty? Or, um, w in, or is it very small and negative? I don't know exactly how negative this is, but um, depending on the area you're look, looking at, you could um, change your your um, the slope between your aerosols a little bit. So this is done automatically, but if you see something's going wrong, then you can um, go back and change change these factors a little bit. This image actually uses a per pixel different slope between those um, yeah. things. So it, sh it should work here pretty well, but we're we're going below zero. You can just answer our question, but so each pixel has its own exponential? In this case, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like the aerosols could be different right next to land, maybe if there's some. Yeah, yeah, aerosol. yeah. Yeah, the, um, this ratio between the two aerosol correction bands, we have, I haven't got a plot of it here, but it can vary in this scene. Some scenes it's really stable. And then again, if you look at a small sub scene of this, it makes sense to assume that it's fixed and this helps you reduce the noise. Because in the sphere bands, the signal is so, so low that um, there's quite a bit of noise by taking this median, if, if you're looking at this small box, if taking the mean aerosol type w w um, does actually make sense. Uh, okay, so let's look at some things in more detail because we're looking at 7,000 pixels here, which um, it's not really doing it much justice if we keep looking at a full, full scene. So this is... Uh, one of the wind farms in the image, I think um, a number of, uh, there's a number of wind farms, so we've got a couple of them in the Belgian coastal zone here. There's an enormous amount of wind turbines here. And this is one of the things we're also using this high resolution data for. So each of these dots is a wind turbine and you can see they have this little tails attached, which is um, the impact of the construction on the suspended sediment concentration. And this, we can also tell from the way these things are oriented, it's a, it's a, it's a flood tide with the tidal current going in this direction. So if we are at another point, we have um, a, an appetite um, image, the tails would be going in the other direction. So they're orienting with uh, the tidal current. And again, also here you see some very nice things. So that's five kilometers at submodis pixel scale variability. So we can look at I haven't looked at wind speed in particular, but at this resolution also, if you have a very windy day, you will have waves which will um, um, reduce the, the signal of these things a little bit and you have more mixing, so you also diffuse the, 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 the structure of these things a little bit. structure or is it due to the turbine? It's the, the, the actual pole that's been hammered into the seabed and uh, we don't know yet if it's scoured around the base of the pole or if it's there's a turbidity layer that's been um, mixed up to the surface by, by turbulence. So here we can look at uh, that's marine reflectance in the red band. Um, you see we see a clear difference um, in those in those little things. We actually also see this in the longer wavelength bands because the surface roughness of these wakes is a little bit different because the current speeds up al along these structures. So we have both the surface effect but also a 
change in sediment concentration. And then um, there's this sim simple one-band um, SPM algorithm. We can plug this um, uh, marine reflectance at this red wavelength. We can just plug it in here and then um, get an estimate of mass concentration of sediments in, in each of those things. And so you can see there's here there's a, a quite a big difference inside and outside of these um, of these of these turbid wakes. Uh, another thing we're looking at is well the Belgian coastal zone. We also have wind farms here. They're in slightly deeper water, slightly clearer water, so we don't see these um, these wakes as often. But we have uh, an important port here, and we have here the Western Skeld estuary going to the port of Antwerp, which is um, the second biggest port of um, Europe, quite important, um, 190 million tons of freight per year, that's about 15,000 ships coming through per year. And then Rotterdam is just to the north of here in the Netherlands, which is um, I think the biggest European port. But you can see there's a lot of sediments here as well, and there's big ships going through these things, and they have to be dredged out um, regularly. This dredged material is generally dumped back into the sea, so we are using these, um, people are using models to see where, if you dump the, the sediment somewhere, where will it end up. But with this kind of imagery, we can um, see if the models are running correctly for just the natural, natural state. And also in Zeebrugge, um, we have um, a port that's open to the to the sea, and during flood tide, we see sediments coming into the the port that have to be dredged out. So here again, we can. This is now a turbidity um, product. So turbidities go up to 80 and actually go beyond 80 here. This is in this area about a one-one relationship with suspended particulate matter concentration. So we have quite extremely turbid um, uh, regions here and also near the near the port of Antwerp. So these are all sediments going into the navigational channels which, which need to be removed. If we zoom in on Zeebrugge, um, we see this is, uh, this is also a flood tide image. We see nice this sediment plume going into, into the port and we see actually a dredger coming back from dumping dredge material so it's coming back here to collect these things and bring them back out. Um, so people are also, they have uh, very high resolution hydrodynamical models of this port and they're trying to get this thing right. If they can estimate this sediment um, contribution, so the currents around the port, sediment going into the port right, they can start looking at um, what happens if you put a construction here that will change the current flow, will it reduce sediment um, import into the, the port. So we're using remote sensing to validate um, sediment transport models and in this case with Landsat we can do it at very high, well at high resolution. It's not very clear here but we have a measurement pole here and there's this tiny tiny wake attached to it so we also have a measurement pole that's measuring um, in situ data changing the data, well changing the area around it and we've had a we've had an Aeronet station there for a year. It's now the Aeronet is now back at, at NASA for calibration. But um, we have had many deployments of benthic instruments um, just um, downstream of this. So during flood tide, the, the wake is going this way. During ebb tide, the wake is going this way. And now my colleagues are looking back into the archives of the deployments to see well during ebb tide we actually measure um, what, the, what the platform, what the structure is doing. So um, we have not a lot of validation data because the overpass time, we have 16 day revisit time, but we've had uh, this Airnet OC station uh, running for a year on this, on this, on this uh, platform. And so in the blue, well, the Aeronet station, it, it does something similar. It does a sky measurement, it does a water measurement, and um, collects irradiance as well. So it, it's um, a ground truthing thing of, this, um, of these satellite images. So in blue, we have the two closest uh, Aeronet OC measurements to the Landsat overpass in, 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 in this case. And 
we have here in red and black the two atmospheric correction methods I just um, described. So in black it's using the red and infrared band, in red it's using the short wave infrared bands. You see the shape is pretty well, um, corresponds pretty well to this uh, uh, to this shape that's been measured in situ by this autonomous system. And I've plotted here uh, the CDAS processing which in some cases gets very close and does very well even in, in the blue while we with the extrapol uh, exponential extrapolation are not always very good in the blue there but then um, some cases we're we're doing a little bit better in the green and, and the red so more about this dredging so we saw this on an image which was quite <laughs> uh, strange this is uh, a dredging ship that has been dredging in Ostend and is going offshore to dump these things. This is a legal at activity, so <laughs> they have to get rid of the sediment somewhere, so there's designated areas where the sediment has to go. In this case, the ship wasn't actually at this position, so that's it's not really a, a good application, but uh, we found that they were not in the, in the good um, location, because um, if the location's here, they have to travel um, extra miles and this costs a lot of money. So they prefer to do shorter trips to do the dredging. <laughs> and you also see that um, during dredging activities all these things get churned up inside the port and we even get a, an, an outflow of this, this material uh, from the port. So again this is also a flood tide image. You can see the plume nicely going along shore. So this is an image of one of those uh, um, ships, so this is filled with this um, anoxic sediments from the port and you actually see also during transport some of this spills out. So this is an aerial photograph, it's on the satellite image. Um, and I've developed a simple algorithm to detect these events um, with using just two tests we check whether the near infrared reflectance is high. So uh, maybe I should go back too far. So this is um, looking at this band. So if the near infrared reflectance is higher than 0.1, so in this case it's not higher than 0.1, and we're also looking at the maximum visible reflectance, so we're looking at the, the, um, the red, green and two blue channels. If the maximum reflectance of this is less than 0.7, which in this case it's not because this is uh, higher than 0.07. We uh, trigger this flag, so I'll show you. If we look at this subscene and we plot the water reflectance at 865 and the maximum visible reflectance, we get something like this. And then if we apply these tests, we limit ourselves to the pixels that fall outside of this, this range. I've called it here absorbing sediment flag, but it's it's should I should have changed it to black sediment flag, or it's a mixture between absorbing materials and sediments. Well, if we apply this test on this uh, this image, we see we have a very scattering waters. We have high reflectance in the near infrared, but low reflectance, low maximum reflectance in those three visible bands. So we don't pick up all of the bands, but that's because this is these are rather arb arbitrary uh, values, but this does indicate that it's highly scattering, that there's a lot of um, sediment in the water. If we relax this criteria a little bit to um, correspond to the ambient um, near infrared reflectance, we do pick up more of this. We also pick up um, this in the in within the port. And actually, I think that the near infrared reflectance of this patch, which I think is the oldest patch because we can practically track what the ship's been doing, I think that this, um, this, the particles in this patch have settled down, but the absorbing material is still um, well mixed in, in the water column. So we see actually a, a, a decrease of the marine reflectors in the near infrared band, but the maximum visible reflectors is still low. So I, that's why I think the, this material is sediments plus some absorbing dissolved thing that sticks to the sediments. And or is mixed with the sediments. 
And we've looked at some other images where we also see these um, plumes and it seems to work pretty well. Um, there's a big one here. So we pick it up pretty well. Um, we have some problems here, if you see on the last image. That's cloud shadows and they are pretty difficult to detect. Um, clouds we can detect pretty easily because they're bright, they're white. But cloud shadows, in some cases, the reflectance spectrum of, of points here in these, in these cloud shadows look exactly like um, reflectance spectra in dark waters or um, um, clear, clear waters with, with uh, less sediment. So uh, that's about it, what we're doing in, in the Belgian coastal waters, but it's quite irresistible to look at all these different Landsat images for, from different regions and see what's, what else is going on. So I, I've got three examples here of, of some, th some other regions. This is a lake in Venezuela where you have a ton of these little dots. You have these green, huge green patches here and you have this gray material uh, on, the, on the surface. Anyways, anyone wants to guess what we're looking at? We're looking at oil derricks. So these are all oil derricks in this lake and all this gray stuff you see is just oil slicks on the, on the lake's surface. So I uh, hear gas is cheap in Venezuela. <laughs> and then this green stuff is a huge bloom of this, of this duckweed. So we, we can now spatially resolve these things um, with Landsat 8. <coughs> um, this is another one. These are oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. So we can see individual oil rigs there. We do see that the big oil rigs, they seem to have some effects on the surface there. I don't know if I put, yes. So there's these lines, I think are, m might be related to these constructions there. If they're um, turbid or um, just effects of surface roughness differences, I'm not sure. And we have the panchromatic channel on Landsat 8, so we can go down from 30 meters to 15 meter resolution, which is pretty fun to do for, for these constructions. So you can even see these red dots, um, that's the, the gas being burnt off, so gas flares on, on, these, uh, on these platforms. You see also here smoke, and then you have some <coughs> slicks here on, on, the, on the water as well. And I think this is last one, this is a cyan cyanobacteria bloom, also at an ocean color validation site. So this little dot here is a tower ha that has one of those Airnet OC stations as well. And this thing is a huge um, cyanobacteria bloom. Where is Sweden. Sweden. Sorry? In Baltic. Yeah, in the Baltic, yeah. So that's uh, the Gustav Dahlen Airnet OC station. And I have many more of these, but I've limited here to, to three, three examples. And then um, if there's no more questions, I will go into to Acolyte, which is a software that can do many of these things I've presented here. Yeah. Um, Quentin, as you know, for ocean charter satellites, there's a station around the world to try and um, estimate the gains that the satellite should have and, and, and all this issue of vicarious calibration. Do you know anything about the vicarious calibration for Landsat? Do you know how it's done? Because, I mean, these images are amazing. Yeah. Uh, but sensors degrade in time, they degrade when, I mean, there's some things changing as you send them to space. And I'm wondering if there's some, just like there is for, I mean, I don't know if they use mobile or they use something else, but they really tend to. So I think the Landsat. Um, people, they're not doing a vicarious calibration like we do in Ocean Color, but then um, Brian Franz from the OBPG, he's using the Mobi site. They have, from the two years of data, they have two matchups with the Modis, Mobi site and use this to, to derive some vicarious gains for, for the Landsat channels. And then there's uh, Nima Palivan who's, uh, who's correlating Landsat images with Modis data over dark sites um, where the viewing and sun geometries are similar, so he's using some northern sites to, to derive um, these vicarious gains. And actually, they're pretty similar using those two different methods. And are these entered into Acolyte and into CDAS? So, um, so CDAS uses uh, the gains Brian has um, computed by default, and in Acolyte I, I have the option to use 
uh, flat gain, so just once everywhere, or use Brian's or Nima's um, gains. So you, you can play with the gains in, in Acolyte. So any questions? Good. Make a couple of comments. You know, years ago, people thought Landsat was fairly useless for ocean work because it just didn't have the good quality uh, bandwidth and spectral resolution, and it was really designed for land. After all, it's Landsat. Uh, but the latest version here, uh, eight, I guess it is, you know, really is quite useful for oceanography due to people like Quentin and Kevin Ruddick and others doing what you just saw here to, you know, get it. Know, sort of checked out. It's obviously quite quite useful now. Okay, it's 30 meters resolution. There's another set of commercial satellites called Worldview. There's Worldview 2, and I think 3 is up now, and 4 is ready to launch. They have 1 meter resolution now, and they've got 4 bands, I think, in the visible, kind of like Landsat. The catch is they don't do any atmospheric correction. You get top of the atmosphere radiuses with a world view image and then you do your own atmospheric correction or whatever you want to do. The signal to noise ratio is not very good but it is starting to be used for things like people mapping coral reefs for example where you need meter scale resolution and so depending on whether you're looking at Nader or looking off Nader, you know, it gets somewhere around one to two meters of resolution. And I've used worldview imagery for various things, and sometimes it worked quite well, and sometimes it doesn't because I did the atmospheric correction didn't work, and so I got bad retrievals of things like depth. But it's another satellite that's out there. It is commercial, so you have to pay for the imagery. It's not outrageous. And once again, it's not designed for oceanographers, but it's useful for oceanographers. So, you know, Google Worldview, and uh, you'll come up with information on the satellites. And I don't know what they charge per image, but um, Thousands. Uh, it's still, if you're doing a study like Quentin's doing here at wind farms, you can get, you know, a few square kilometers and see not just the wind farms, but see almost the guy standing on it. So it's really there, it's useful. People do use it for certain things. So just keep in mind when you go back home and want to do remote sensing, there's more than just modus and beers out there that are useful. Is Landsat tilted? Uh, it's currently native viewing, but there is a, there is possibility of uh, tilting the instrument away. So. Um, Nima's talking to the USGS guys to see whether they could do some acquisitions. I think it can tilt up to 15 degrees, so if they could tilt it away from, from the east side or the Sun Glint side, yeah. So, I think I'll um, do a quick demo of where to get Landsat data and how to use my software um, to, to process the data and see what comes out of it or if there are no more questions. I have a, I should have a nice Pleiade image, so it's similar to the satellites um, Kurt was talking about, um, going down to 70 centimeters, so we have an image somewhere. Uh, maybe. Also, to put the magnitude of these kind of environmental things in perspective, just off the coast of the state of Louisiana, so off the Mississippi River, Delta here. There are over 4,000 oil rigs out there. It's the hugest not. You know, we had the big uh, uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico a few years ago, the uh, whatever horizon or whatever the name was. So people kind of mentally think, oh, wow, there's like a dozen of these things out there. No, they're out there by the thousands. And so the environmental effects on things like even changing where sediment gets suspended and deposited is actually now getting to be quite significant. So between wind farms and oil fields and all kinds of other things, it's a huge environmental impact that the average person doesn't think about much. There's also a huge loss of coastline per year. And these tools are what allow you to map the coastline change. And even if you wait every two weeks, it's incredible. So um, this is an example of a, a Pleiade image taken last week um, when um, Kevin was on a cruise. 
So this is one turbine out of uh, 50 turbines in one of the Belgian um, uh, uh, wind parks. You can see this is, uh, it's maybe not so clear here, but you can resolve the individual blades of the, the wind turbines from space. So this is a satellite going very, very fast, looking at something um, down below, 700 kilometers below, and you, you are able to resolve this. In this case, it was very windy, so you see almost nothing from the, the water leaving um, radiances itself. This is almost all sun and sky glint um, because the surface is so so rough. It looks like um, crumpled up tin foil. Have you ever seen any work dealing with this kind of glint? Very high um, I've seen people using the near infrared channel to do glint corrections in clear waters, but here you have a signal in the near infrared as well, so it's quite difficult with this limited um, band set to do to do a glint correction, for example. So okay, um, I'll just show you briefly where to get a Landsat image of your region. Some of you already have a Landsat image, which is great. So um, I'm using mm, these two sites here. It's earthexplorer.usgs.gov. Um, so you have this nice Google map thing, which you can use to browse to your region. And then um, you can just double click um, to set a pin or take two pins. Or you can use this button, um, use map, which just sets the search limit to the zoom level. So you can see if you zoom out, that was the previous zoom level. But if you, yeah, you can zoom in uh, there and set use map, then it only will look for images that contain this actual um, region. And this is also pretty nice. Um, you can get the coordinates of this box, which you can input in Acolyte to just cr process the image to this extent. So full images are pretty big. If you crop to a certain extent, you could get maybe a better aerosol correction. You run the processing much faster. So you could note these things down to get your region of interest. And then data sets, we just want to look at one of them here. This is a Landsat archive. We just want Landsat 8. So the, the two instruments on Landsat 8, they're typically bundled together in one, in one archive file. You have this second thing here, which you, um, that's also just good Landsat data, but from before Mar uh, May 2013. And then if we click results, we should see a list of uh, images pop up. So there was an image. 11th of July 2015 that had us in so we can use this site to download it so this site requires you to make an account which is really easy you just um, choose a username um, and then validate your account using your email address but then you can download this and we need the level one geotiff data product so this is um, this is an archive file that contains the 11 different bands on Oli and Tears, which you can read into Acolyte to do your atmosphere correction. So if you download this now, that would take about 20 minutes to 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and if everyone does it at the same time, that would choke the Wi-Fi a little bit. Uh, now this Libra browser, um, it's a little bit of a different interface, but it works quite similarly. You, you zoom in. And then you see these number appear, which are the different tile sets. So Landsat 8 data is provided in different rows and paths and row numbers. So each of these orbits is one path, and then it gets chopped up in, in different rows. So generally, you, your region is in one of them. In our case here, we are in a couple of overlapping tiles, so we could maybe get some more, more data. So if you look at this tile, we see there are seven images that match the criteria we put here. So default, it goes to this, but we can look at the full mission and don't care about cloud cover. We see in the full mission, there's 52 images now from Landsat 8 on this, on this tile set. And you can have a, look, a quick look here to see where, which ones are cloud free. And um, yeah. 
So you can download them here easily. Um, there's two options here, download bundle. This is the same file you get from USGS, but this is hosted on Google servers, so the transfer should go a little bit faster. And if you um, want to use Google utilities such as GSutil, you can download these files directly from command line or Python scripts or, or whatever. That goes much faster than going through the web browser and, and finding these images. Um, download bands. Uh, lets you choose individual bands um, and this download goes via the Amazon web services so it's also pretty fast but only includes data from 2015 onwards but typically f what we want is all of the bands from the the OLI instrument and now um, I don't know what happens failed yeah so generally, I think you want to bundle because then you extract it. You have a nice directory containing all the different GeoTIFF files that have different band information in it. So I'll show you. Um, this is one of those images um, that I downloaded from this site. I think it's this one. So it's a nice cloud-free image. I downloaded it, I got a bundle file, and this bundle file contains all this information. So you have, um, just, you have these nine files, which are the nine channels on the OLI. We have one file that's um, bigger than the others. This is the panchromatic channel. We have um, four times as many pixels, so the file is four times the size. And then we have the two thermal bands on the tiers, and then the this is a quality assessment band, which I don't use, and um, a metadata file that contains information on the date when the scene was acquired, uh, and also some scene center information on sun geometry and viewing geometry. Yeah. I didn't hear what you said the BQA is quality assessment file. It's yeah, it's some some sort of quality assessment file. We ignore it. We do our own quality assessment. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, what we are ready to go and use the tool I developed to process this image. So the tool is called Acolyte. It's a light version of the atmospheric correction. We do some simplifications and um, some assumptions that are different from, from CDAS. Um, I'm using Linux here, so I just moved to this directory. Uh, so you see there's a couple of things in here. It's the Acolyte um, script that launches the IDL runtime and then um, there's the IDL runtime included. Some input files, so in this input there's a couple of um, configuration files. And then I've also included here the scene containing those 11 different uh, files. Now if I just... So is, it, is it processing the chip files? Yeah, it's, so it's it's reading in. Sorry. It's the chip files that you saved, one for each band. It's processing those. Yeah, so it it needs to be. Uh, you need to point to this MTL file, which is the metadata file, or the directory, and then it will look for the MTL file. So it will open the the different bands from the different TIFF files as needed. So if you're using band six and seven, it will open those those bands. Does it require an IDL license? No. So we include a runtime, so you don't need a, a license. It it does mean that if you launch the thing, you have to click something before you can use it. <laughs> but <laughs> so this one doesn't say anything, so it's good to click OK. <laughs> so we have some some buttons you can click here and some menus you can explore. Um, we have input and output. We have input, you need to go to the path of the scene or you can go inside the folder. Hmm. Or you can't. You can just select the path. So this is just the location of the directory with all the different bands. Uh, we can select an output. I'll select input as an output. <laughs> And then here you can input uh, southern, northern, eastern, western boundaries of your region of interest. 
Um, RGB processing, this will make these RGB images I also showed top of atmosphere. This is the one that looks slightly more blue because it doesn't remove the Rayleigh um, scattering. And then you can also do a Rayleigh corrected RGB. 